Well, hello. We are back for another episode of That 90s Baseball Pod, powered by Access Twins. I'm your host, Brandon Warren, and conspicuous by his absence is Mr. Greg Olson, but he will be joining us momentarily. He has a prior engagement, but I'm very delighted to introduce you to, and if you're a Twins fan, you probably are already aware of, Mr. Denny Hawking, the most well-known number seven in Twins history. <laughs> Denny, how are we doing? I'm great. That's a nice introduction. Thanks for that. And they can follow you on Twitter at Big League Swings. Very good stuff over there. I, I think I spy a Team USA sweatshirt. We're, we're on a Zoom call in addition to the podcast, and we'll put this on YouTube. So if people want to see that. But earlier this year, you were hired as the skipper of the U18 team. Can you take us through what exactly that meant to you and what it means going forward? Uh, it was a tremendous honor just to be able to uh, be asked by Ashley Bratcher, the general manager of the USA 18U national team. I got involved by last year, last summer, former twin Jason Maxwell um, was uh, the 18U manager last year. He's been involved in USA baseball for quite some time. He uh, asked me to come to the, the 18U PDP league. So I was like, great. It was at a point when I'd been out of baseball I'd been coaching for 12 seasons in the minor leagues and then got out of baseball at COVID. I wasn't really around it. And then I uh, went down there, just had an incredible time. It's a group of incredibly talented young players. Um, just try to impact them and coach them up a little bit. Uh, they, and then I had an opportunity to go to the next camp, which is trials. So PDP is 96 juniors going into their senior year. P, uh, trials is you cut that 96 to 40. You invite a few sophomores in, they compete for 20 spots, and then they go and do the World Cup. And that's the process this year. Um, and we'll do that down in Sarasota, Florida. But actually, our trials is going to be held at the beautiful complex down there in Lee County, where, uh, where the twins train. So, But I did, did some stuff last year for them. And then uh, Jason wasn't able to do it this year. So Ashley called me and said, hey, would you like to do it? And uh, the answer I gave her probably wasn't the most politically correct answer. It's <laughs> kind of what you say when some you, you think someone's joking. And I was like, you got to be, um, wait, me. wait, let me take, let me take that back. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. And she goes, well, I mean, check your schedule. I'm like, no, I, I'm clear. I'm clear. So it's super excited about the opportunity, super excited about the staff that we put together and being able to invite this junior class in to carry North Carolina at the end of June, get some work in and, and go through the process and compete for a gold medal come uh, September. And when you were asked to come out there, was it on your radar at all that this could be the result? Because I mean, I, my, my experience with the U, uh, U18 team is they actually came to Minnesota and did a little barnstorming tour. And that team was a, a lot of fun. That was my first experience to a very young Francisco Lindor and Bubba Starling was on that team. I'm trying to think of uh, Matt Barnes might've been on that team. Lance McCullers jr. That's my experience with it. But I, I assume you did, you, did you have any idea that this could result in this or was it um, just kind of Holy smokes that came together? Oh, well, one, I had no idea even how USA baseball was put together, what the process was, you know, how to get involved in it. None of that. You know, my son who's a senior this year, never did any of that stuff. So, so the, the process and just the overall organization was just foreign to me. My, my understanding of USA baseball was uh, when we, when we go to the Olympics, that was it. So when I got involved in it last summer, I was like, oh God, this is a pretty cool deal. And I was like, this would be something fun to just be able to tinker around with, you know, during the summer every once in a while and be around some good players. And, and it's going to be super exciting for me this summer because uh, when we go to to PDP, you, 96 kids e equates to four teams. So you have to have four different managers, four different pitching coaches, uh, and then eight different coaches. And basically, you get to choose your staff of people that you trust and all that. And we, we, we've got some names. Like last year's staff was Jason Maxwell, mm -hmm. uh, Michael Kadair, oh, Jack wow. Wilson, and then um, Adam Mosley, Adam Mosley, a pitching coach down in Alabama, he couldn't do it. So Brad Penny stepped in. Oh, this wow. year at PDP, I mean, Latroy Hawkins is going to be a part of it. John Jones, Nick Punto. Uh, we were talking to Joe Maurer about being able to come down. Joe was unable to, there were some conflict, uh, conflicts there. But 
You know, I mean, guys that I haven't seen in a while who I learned a lot from in my big league career, a guy like Greg Swindell is going to come. And I know everybody's thinking, what, are we just putting all twins out there? No, <laughs> it's not all twins. But um, there are a lot of guys that I've, I, I have history with that I'm super excited to, to watch them do their thing, watch them coach guys. Doug Minkiewicz is going to be a huge part of what, what my team's going to do this year. Because in the USA Baseball, like you're looking at, you you're not traditionally branding. You're not traditionally going. Okay, we need two. We need one first baseman, second baseman, third baseman, shortstop. We'll need a guy that can play a couple. We'll need a backup. Like you're trying to get the best puzzle pieces. So when I look at just off of the radar of who's already been invited and all that, I'm like, our first baseman probably is going to be a shortstop. Mm -hmm. You know, so him learning that position. Who do I really trust? Who do I know that can really coach that position up? Dougie, you know, what an incredible player he was, incredible career, um, being so knowledgeable around around first base. And I'm like, I, I need your services to come and help me figure this thing out. So that's kind of how it was. And I'm super excited to get that process off, off the ground here in probably about another month. And yeah, no better person to learn first base from defensively than Doug Mankiewicz. Speaking of, and how's this for a segue, Team USA, we've got Captain America on the line, Greg Olson, taking time out of his schedule, tweeting the unwritten rules of baseball to join us. How are you doing, Greg? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Denny, good man, it's been having you on, brother. It's been a while. Uh, what's up, Ollie? It's great to see you, brother. You too. You too. Uh, I, uh, glad you guys are uh, coming back and helping Team USA because that uh, – a lot of fun on that team, highest honor, and knowing that we got some guys that know what they're doing and putting the puzzle together. Because I don't, uh, you didn't, you didn't know that when we were in it. And it was like, why right, we cut Frank Thomas to take this kid from Tampa named Tino? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> you know. So on on the uh, when you're just roaming around the roster and trying to figure things out, and you're looking at it, going, not seeing that one, and then all of a sudden you start seeing it on a day to day basis, and you're like. Okay. Yeah, no, I got that one. That was good. Good pick. Well, and cool to hear friend of the show, Greg Swindell, taking place. We had Greg on very early in our guest lineup, and he was, as you might expect, phenomenal as well. Uh, well, I mean, he went from he went from big time starting pitcher and then, you know, <laughs> morphed into middle reliever to late lefty to um, you know, way too smart to not use that resource because you know he can he did everything at the major league level sounds like the denny hawking of pitching in my opinion yeah yeah <laughs> uh denny i want to start at the beginning you got to stay home for college what did that mean to you in terms of i mean you weren't drafted out of high school and and you had to obviously scratch and claw your way to get drafted and get to the big leagues but what what was it like staying home for college and being near your uh, your hometown or in your hometown I, uh, my whole journey was kind of different than what you see now. Uh, I was a better high school basketball player than a high school baseball player. I was third team all state in basketball. I was third team all area in baseball. Like I looked at my high school <laughs> career and I just laughed. Um, I played one year of varsity baseball. So I was constantly just, ah, this is fun. Um, I turned down a, a scholarship to a Cal state school in basketball to go to a junior college because the the baseball coach at the Cal State School, I said, hey, I'd love to come here and play baseball too. And he was like, you're not good enough. And I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. Well, I guess um, looking at my future in the NBA probably doesn't look promising. So maybe I'll just, uh, I want to play some baseball. So I went to a junior college for a couple of years and lo and behold, just, you know, the twins took a chance on me. They saw something in me, but it was great. I, I was able to obviously stay home, um, going to a junior college, get some, you know, uh, some general ed classes out of the way, but never being away from home until after I left JUCO and going to Elizabethan, Tennessee was, was a shock. So I don't know if I was prepared to leave. I think it would have been better for me to go to it, you know, out of state to a college, but uh, I certainly don't look back at my journey and say, man, if I would have done it different. Sounds, sounds a little like the Jeff Fry path. Yeah. 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 Um, I got to ask Denny, who, I mean, who helped you make this decision? Because the basketball thing would have been an easy, you know, an easy, no transition, go to college and, you know, you're, you're going to be on scholarship and, and you have this, but you make the hard decision of, you know, looking 
10 years in advance. How, how did you do that? How did you make that decision? Who helped you? Well, Oli, it's crazy. Like when I, at that moment, I was like, oh gosh, stop. Customer service agent. Annual <laughs> Press the number. Oh, All good. This, is, this, is, this makes the show real, which I love. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing a game and I got a producer in my ear right now. Stop. I'm not paying attention. I'm trying to explain something. Yeah. Um, so, so going back to that, you know, when I, when I was like, eh, do I really want to go play basketball? I, I just felt like I loved baseball so much that I really wanted just to play for a couple more years. And I had the option to go to two different junior colleges. One was more academic, lower baseball. And the other one was lower academic, but higher baseball, you know? And I was like, well, what's my future going to be? So I was like, I'll go and play junior college baseball with my buddies. I had like three or four guys that were already going to the JUCO and, you know, said, I'll have a couple fun two years and play some baseball. I'll learn journalism. Then I'll go and, and go to a four year and, and be a student and, you know, learn how to write articles and interview people. And, you know, I wanted to get into sports broadcasting. Hmm. And then uh, like when I got drafted, I had no idea about the draft. I got something, the twins sent me something in the mail and I open up this package and I'm reading this letter. I'm like, I have no idea what this means. And so I gave it to my buddy and he goes, dude, you've been drafted. And I'm like, yeah, I, I can read that. And like, <laughs> but, but what does that mean? And he's like, like you could go sign a professional contract and go play minor league baseball. And I was like, what's minor league baseball? Um, so when I, when I left to, to not play co college basketball, it was to go and study journalism and, and, go and grab a mic and a pad of paper and go, go interview people and be around sports like that. So it's really kind of crazy. My journey. Can we, can we ask you candidly what the bonus is for a 52nd round pick? It was like, well, so 52nd round, I wound up going, didn't sign as a draft and follow. I went back and played my sophomore year. Okay. And then they, the twins have your, had my rights up until a certain date. So once the season was over, <clears throat> they could they could still sign me and if mm -hmm. they said oh well, we don't want you anymore my name would go back in the draft or if i felt like i could have better draft status i could have gone back in the draft but i believe it was like ten thousand dollars and the and the pitch was you don't have to go to the complex we're going to send you to short season and i was mm -hmm. like oh great miss a level already i'm climbing so that's just kind of how it uh, how how it went about but it was great because once i got drafted and i was going through that process uh, my scout Earl Frischman walked into my house and the first thing he said to me was, uh, you know, we don't want to sign you. And I was like, wait, you, you drafted me and now you don't want me to play for you. This is so confusing. So, but, but people right now, people now are so much more educated on, on, on the draft process and things of that nature. And so you went to a loaded E-Town team that year. I mean, you won 51 of, I think, 67 games. Future big leaguers, Rich Becker, Brent Brady, Damian Miller. Uh, I feel like the season that you had with the incredible on-base percentage, stealing some bags, when you come in as a 52nd round pick, you really have to show up to get noticed and to keep moving along. Uh, what, what did having such a strong first season and short season ball mean to you in terms of, all right, I can do this. Let's get moving and see if we can make it. It really showed me how mentally tough I was. Um, I, once I left, once I went and we went to a mini camp and only you remember these, you know, you get drafted, you go to mini camp. We went down to Sarasota, the Buck O'Neill complex, which is still there. Yeah. And, uh, we, we, you're down there for about 10 days. So you're training, you're learning things, you're learning, you know, bunt plays, things of that nature. And then you're inner squatting. I did not hit a ball out of the infield for the seven games that we played. Mind you, I just learned how to hit left-handed. So I'm hitting left-handed for less than a year. And then I go to my first introduction to pro ball, a mini camp, and I don't hit a ball out of the infield. I'm on a bus driving to, uh, to Elizabeth's in Tennessee going, what am I doing? I, I'm like, I'm over my skis. I can remember my first at bat was left-handed walking up going, why don't you just stand in the right-handed batter's box? Yeah. And then just going through being around good players and we were incredible that year we wound up winning 21 straight games in a row um you know roy smith ray smith was, was an incredible uh, an incredible coach just having an opportunity to play for him in my first year of pro ball what was so important for the development and then the twins minor league staff there was always guys that could simplify teaching 
and, and, and it was always positive. And that's one thing I remember about my early times in the minor leagues and just, we, it was crazy. I think the day that I really thought and just through stupidity uh, <laughs> that I could play in the big leagues was we had had a, uh, a team event that night. And in Elizabeth, then the town's not very big. So the fire chief is the police chief is the mayor. And when anybody does anything, everybody knows about it. Well, we wound up having a little event one night and um, it, it got back to, to Smitty. And the next day we were, all right, guys, don't worry about your gloves. Just we're going to go. And we went on the line and we started running and we started running and we started running. <laughs> Excuse me. And I remember standing on like a line in between sprints going, you didn't sign up to train to be a track athlete. So either you got two options right now. You can either stop running and just go, dude, I, I didn't sign up to be to be a track guy. Are we here to play baseball or what? And or option B was, do you think you can get to the big leagues? Shut your mouth and just do it and it'll be done. And for some unknown reason, I, I chose after probably like two weeks of minor league baseball of saying, just shut your mouth, do the work, and then it'll it'll be over and you'll be fine. And that's kind of how I look at once I got baptized into minor league baseball. Yeah. Go ahead, Brendan. Oh, so I, well, I want to ask you about, so you move, you keep moving along a guy you came up with who I think is one of the more underrated twins of all time, but battled some injuries is, uh, is rich Becker. And I thought he was kind of ahead of his time. He came up at the wrong time, taking all those walks. He might've been a, a really good fit for that Oakland A's team that you guys took care of in the playoffs. But, um, you would have come up with a fair number of these guys that you played with. What was that like? And, and was Rich Becker, am I on the mark that he was pretty underrated? Yeah, I would think so. You know, Aurora, Illinois, and I, I think I'm getting that right. You know, um, he, he was incredible. He was an on-base machine. And I played with Beck in E-Town, Kenosha, Visalia, and, and then AA when he got to the big league. Like we were at every level. And what I remember about him was he would walk a hundred times a year. He would strike out a hundred times a year and he would have over a hundred hits. And it didn't matter what year, what level, that's who his DNA was. And, and I would agree with you, Brandon. I think he was a guy that he was prime fit for Billy Bean Moneyball yeah. before Moneyball ever happened. Um, and I just think that just, it might've been something that the twins maybe just got tuned off on just, just some different numbers. It could have been somebody else coming up and taking his spot. But um, yeah, I look back and, and think that he could have had a, had a, a bigger impact, a longer career and it just didn't work out. Yeah. And another guy I felt was super underrated was Shane Mack when Kirby Puckett kind of got the accolades and, and fairly so he's a hall of famer, but Shane Mack was right there a couple of those years. And then the strike hits, he bounces around, he goes overseas, comes back, but that's about it. Um, the numbers he was putting up, I think we all kind of slept on because we didn't really understand how good he was compared to Kirby Puckett. Big daddy, Shane Mack. Uh -huh. Yeah, he was incredible. He was an incredible baseball player to watch. At that time when I was up there, um, you know, and I was up and down during, during his time there, it was just incredible to sit there and watch him go about his business. He, he was such incredible bat speed, such a physical presence, so strong. And uh, I always used to trip out on him because he would be in the last group of BP. He'd get done and he'd walk upstairs, batting gloves still on, and he would go and grab a burger off the George Foreman grill and oh. eat it. And I'm like, wait, like, don't you want to wash your hands or just like, you know, there's pine tar. And I'm like, and then I started thinking, wow, maybe that's why he's such a good hitter. <laughs> you know, pine tar on your burger, huh? That's okay. I would never tried it, but he was, he, he was, he was a really good baseball player, uh, but such an incredible teammate as well. And not just to the guys that he had already played with and all that as a young player, he always had time for me and he was always, you know, just super nice and accommodating as well. Awesome. Hey, give me a, uh, give me favorite minor league stories as, as clean as it can be. You know. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Or, you know, you can come back to that one and you give me a Tom Kelly story. That's where I was going yeah. next to TK when you when you met TK. Uh, you know, hey, so we, you were talking, we were talking, you played, you know, minor leagues with Damian Miller, Brent Brady. I had both of those guys in Arizona in 98. And the Tom Kelly stuff, man, was like, 
Brent Brady, Brent Brady tells me this, and you know how kind of somber he is. Oh, uh, please tell me the please tell me the Yankee Stadium story. <laughs> Go was, that ahead. Where, was that the one where he fell down? No, 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 no. Okay, so apparently he strikes out swinging in the box, falls over, and he comes walking back into the dugout. And Tom Kelly just looks at me and goes, Son, you're just not a whole lot of fun to watch. <laughs> and it's it's his rookie year, and it's Tom Kelly, and he's just like demoralized. And yeah. he this, and he's telling the story, and you can just see his face just drop. And I'm just going, I had to leave the room so I could start laughing at him, you know, because it was it was priceless. Well, and TK is our only landline guest yeah. of, uh, ever. We had we had him on a landline, and we had to get through like a telemarketing. Uh, if you're a telemarketer, you have to hang up. So TK is old school, man. Uh, I don't know if yeah. you could describe him any other way, but yeah. Get, your baptism under fire under him had to be a lot of fun. Uh, it was incredible. I don't remember my first day of, of meeting him, but just you could like, anytime you can tell a story about TK, it's going to lead to another one and another one and another one. And um, Jason Maxwell would, would call TK on occasion, you know, right now and ask him stuff about USA baseball and things of that nature. And, when Jason told me that, I was like, you know what? You, you've got to give me TK's number. I haven't talked to that man in so long. And so he gave me TK's number and I called him probably about six months ago. And he picks up the phone. He's like, uh, hello. And I'm like, is this Tom Kelly? And he's like, uh, yes, it is. I'm like, hey, TK, it's Denny Hawking. And he goes, did I lose a bet? <laughs> I'm like, same guy, you know, um, but T TK was he was incredible to play for. Um, demanded very very little from you. He demanded um, you to be on time, you to be intelligent, and you to be accountable. And when you know that going in, it's super easy to play for for him. Uh, he was a guy that didn't take excuses. I remember I was there was a period where I was had a couple hits in a game or I was playing pretty good, and you know kind of feeling myself. And all of a sudden, uh, I missed a hit and run. And it was like Steinbach on first base. And oh. I see him go, and he's running. And I'm like, why is he trying to steal a bit? Oh, I think I missed a hit and run. So I wind up making it out at the end of that at bat. And I come in the dugout, and TK goes, uh, he, he, he was one of three people that called me Dennis. TK would call me Dennis, my mother would call me Dennis, and then an old girlfriend would call me Dennis. And it was funny because <laughs> here he goes, Dennis? And I'm like, oh, God. Yeah. And, and I walk down. He goes, uh, can you explain that or something? And I go, well, TK, you see what had happened was, and as I'm trying to get into this long excuse, he literally turns his back on me. And in mid-sentence, I'm like, no to self. Just tell him you effed up and move on. That's and I awesome. never had another, I had plenty of opportunities to make excuses. And every time I was like, my bad, I screwed it up. Didn't see it. And, and he, he, he much rather hear that than an excuse. When I met him the first time I brought up, and I, I suspect you probably weren't up yet in 93 when they had that marathon game with 22 innings and Munoz wins it on the, the homer over the baggie. But I bring up the story and then, TK is like, oh, that was a day game. And I'm like, no, it was a night game. You guys played real late. And he goes, yeah, Chip Hale was at second. He couldn't play second base, though. And, like, we're talking about all this. And it was just amazing, his recall and yeah. the things he focused on. Ah, Chip Hale couldn't play second base. I was like, what? But that was my, uh, my introduction in addition to him telling a story about Wayne Hathaway on the bus, oh. bawling his eyes out when it was on fire. And I thought, man, you know, I'd watched TK all these years but never interacted with him. And all the stories kind of added up. Yeah, right. Ole, I know you've got some great stories of TK as well. Oh, no, my, 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 my favorite one, it, he, I was only there for a month and a half and, and I, you know, gotten myself mechanically screwed up and, and uh, didn't get, I didn't see what was going on, didn't get any help. And, you know, I'm out of there in a month. And um, he just looked at me when he called me in the office and, and he was almost ready to cry. And I was like, well, you know, can I go down to AAA? And he's like, not an option. I was like, all right, I guess I'm going home. And, um, 
you know, Kansas City calls me up and I'm there in, in a couple of weeks and I get myself cleaned up and finish a decent season. But he was uh, first time I walk in, I think I'm on year seven, you know, it was my seventh year in the big leagues. And I throw, you know, he, he, we called it pitchers BP. So I was throwing pitchers BP, which he's basically saying that the pitchers are working, the hitters are in the box. I don't give a crap if you give them anything good to hit. I want you to get working. And uh, so I throw and I'm, I'm in, uh, in the training room, I, you know, getting some ice and he comes walking by me and I just thrown BP and had the ice bags from like here down to, down to the fingertips and had the other shoulder, had everything being ice. And he went walking by me and I kind of snickered. And, you know, it was like, you don't see your manager icing up, let alone the full body ice and walking around the clubhouse. So I kind of, I kind of smirked and, you know, and he's like, what the fuck are you laughing about? <laughs> I, went, I was like, damn, I'm getting cut. Yeah. Getting, day two of camp, I'm, I already pissed off TK. <laughs> I mean, after that, I was just on eggshells. It was like, he had me, he had me every time. He was so sarcastic, so straight that I never knew where I was standing. It was just like, I love, I love the man. I really did. It was just it was it was stressful when you come over and you're like you know walking on eggshells around your manager a little bit yeah and, and then you you look back and you realize like just show up early be accountable and and yeah. be a good dude and, and everything's going to be fine it, it was incredible he ha he had his ways about him and he had his little intricacies and, and just when uh, there's when you're around it you start to understand it but when you leave you're just so appreciative of it and, yeah. and i was I look at guys, everybody that I ever played for in minor leagues and big leagues, like the one that I adapt my coaching style to, the way the way that I talk in the dugout, it's it's insane how it just morphs Tom Kelly. Good man, yeah. I think my, my other mistake was asking him. So I got invited to play in his card game, <laughs> and first, first first road trip to Detroit, and I was just making conversation. I was like, "How'd you do last night?" He's like, "None of your damn business." <laughs> All right. I was like, damn, I, I can't get anything straight here, man. I was like, going, just, I was just trying to make conversation. We played in the same card game. I have a pretty decent idea how you did. I was just. <laughs> we, yeah, uh, it was funny. Like, you know, he was, there would be times when the only time you would talk to him would be when you'd walk in, you'd walk in the clubhouse door and you'd walk by his office. You'd look in and say, Hey TK. And then you'd say goodbye on the way out. Like there would be times when that's the entire conversation for about three days. Yeah. And, and you had no idea because he's always doing other things. And I remember we were sitting on the bench. This is before we're going to stretch at the Metrodome. And I'm sitting there and he comes and sits right next to me. And I'm like, okay. But doesn't say anything. And, I'm, and it feels like 10 minutes. It was probably 10 seconds. And it's just he and I on the bench. And he goes, so I'm at the dog track today. We're in the seventh race. I've got money on the five dog. And, and I'm like, only oh, he's talking to me over here. And I'm like, and he's almost done with the show. I'm like, oh, you're talking to me. The first <laughs> conversation he would have with you had zero to do with your profession, the team, the situation. <laughs> They're like, random stuff. So I'm on 18 and I hit a drive and it goes in the woods and I'm like, dad, do I really want to go find the bond? And you're like, wait, what are we talking about? It was crazy. But uh, I want to ask you, what was the vibe? I mean, you were up and down in 96, but I feel like that team had some pretty reasonable expectations with teaming up Puckett and Paul Molitor and Knobloch had a great year, but then, you know, Puckett comes up with the glaucoma, his career's over. Was there a, a, a like a, an air above the team that year of like what it could have been? Because I mean, I, I don't think anybody was saying you guys were going to win the World Series or anything. Maybe not even make the playoffs, but that had the look of a pretty darn good offense if everything had come together. Yeah, I look at that team and, and I start to realize that there was never in, in my time there there was never an air about us going out at the beginning of the season saying, you know what, we're going to do something special this year. I think it was always so professional in how you prepared for your job, 
what was what was the goal going in go win a series that was from from the first time i debuted in 93 to the end of my career in 03 there i always felt like if you take care of your expectations which is go out and win a series you will reap the benefits in the end when you talk about that 96 team incredible talent on that team and but i never felt like guys were picking up the paper looking and going okay we're in this position if we do this then we'll go here and all that but i think that was a testament to to tom kelly um and then the players in that locker room and, and also the, the front office they always if you if you as a player put the organization in a situation to go grab a guy at the at the deadline they would do it hmm. wow but, yeah. um What's one of your favorite memories, big league level? What? Um, my third day in the big leagues, I got called up on a Friday, went doubleheader Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday. Sunday was Nolan Ryan day. <laughs> and I have a, I have a Nolan story, but what I, one of the things I remember about that day was Nolan throws his warm up pitches <laughs> And he walks over to the third base line and he sticks his hand in the grass and like he's feeling for moisture. And I, I, I'm, I'm like 46 hours in the big leagues at this time only. And I'm looking going, what is he doing? And somebody's like, hey, he's checking for moisture, but don't bunt on him. And I was like, okay, no, to self, don't bunt today. Got it. And then Kirby's like, I'm going to show you young bucks how this, how this is going down. This guy ain't got nothing. And he just starts MF and Nolan Ryan from the dugout. <laughs> and I'm like, this dude is crazy. And he's like, I'm going to take his ass deep and blah, blah, blah. First pitch, Nolan throws him as like a high cheese. And, you know, Kirby, he could get his barrel to anything. He hits it. And then he's waddling around the bases like he would. And it was, he comes in the dugout. He's like, I told you, I showed you. And I'm like, Wait, where, where's the cape that you wear? Because you are a flat out superhero. Yeah. So one of my earliest memories of of um, of of my big league career was just little things like that. And I mean, I go back and look, and and being in the big leagues for parts of thirteen years, there's so many different things that only you know you come across. And being a being a pitcher when you're not playing every single day you can just have the opportunity to sit there and take things in. Yeah. And, and I remember so much more about things I experienced as a spectator in a uniform or as a fan in a dugout than really something that I accomplished personally. And there, you know, you, we can go back and go, oh, I did this at one point and I did this at one point. Yeah. And those are all great, but but being able to, um, experience things and watch other people have success and, and um, savor those moments was was probably some of the biggest things that that I was able to go through. You mentioned your mental toughness in the minor leagues. Did that did that go hand in hand with mental preparedness? Because as a utility player, you know you got into a hundred games a year. Let's see, six five six years there in a row. But I'm sure you have to be prepared in a different way. Did those go hand in hand? Mental toughness with mental preparedness. No, absolutely. You know, and I think, and, and just mental, mental toughness is something that is, is such a real topic right now. And, you know, dealing with high school kids uh, on a daily basis when, when I'm doing lessons and, and my own child being a, a high school player and, and then my daughters being in their fifth year of college and knowing some of their teammates, like mental toughness is a real thing. And, and to be able to talk about it to be able to understand that it's actually okay to we, we we say hey how you doing to people every single day but and, and most of the time that we don't mean it but when when you really start to think about mental toughness and you start to open your eyes and you start to understand like this is a person i need to reach out today because there's some little vibe that i'm not grooving on and my hey how you doing needs to be said in a different way and i think it's super important to be able to check on on uh, on people on the daily and you don't have to do it all the time but just if you're aware of 
other people's potential mental struggles. Uh, I think it will go a long way. And it's something that needs to be talked about. It's something that needs to be addressed. And Naomi Osaka did it and, and, and kind of really started to bring it out there. So when I look back at, at the stuff that I did, I never knew about it. I never sat in a hotel room and said, man, I'm going to make it to the big leagues because I'm such a mental grinder. I think it's just something that that y- you did. But looking back on it, I realized that that was a key component to my journey, the success, the longevity. And it's something that I really talk to people that I'm around each and every day or once a week um, to be able to kind of push them through moments and, and, and being able to, um, we, in our cage, we have a board and it's got a whole bunch of different sayings. And I was with a kid last night and I said, give me something that you're focusing on right now on that board. And he goes, being more physical and less mental. And I was like, okay, then let's really attack that today. And I'm with a kid for an hour talking, hitting, doing all that. And that was the main focus. So looking back, uh, mental toughness, uh, yes, it was there. But was it something that I really kind of dug down deep and said, this is what I'm going to rely on? No, it was just the, how, how you were raised and just go out there and go out there and compete. And that's what I try to tell people now. And, and if you can have that compete gene in your body, uh, I think there's so many other little variables that, that are going to help you along the way. Oh, man. That, that, dude, that's, no, that's awesome that you're able, it's, it's a hard, it's hard in the clubhouse because everybody's going through something and just, you know, yeah. getting past the, how you doing, man. And then the re- normal response being all good and you, yes. and just whitewash over everything instead of, you know, finding a way to dig a little bit deeper at it. Um, I appreciate you doing that. That's, that's, uh, that's solid. So. Yeah. Oh, I got it. I got it, Denny. I got it. I got to give you. So the Nolan Ryan going over and touching the third baseline or, you know, you said he was yeah. feeling the moisture. I'm, I think I'm 92, 91, 92 and, and Nolan's on the bump and, and does go, you know, throws the last warm up pitch and goes over and just basically stamps on the, on the grass right next to the, you know, the bunting zone and just kind of just stamps on it and just, you know, like checking for the turf or, you know, like you said, and I'm sitting next to Mike Flanagan. I was like, Flanagan, what's he doing? Never seen it. And he goes, he's basically saying, just don't bunt or I'll kill you. And I'm going, <laughs> does that actually work? I was like, can I do that? <laughs> he's, like, he's like, no. And I was like, well, I want to be able to do that. I hate when guys are bunting. And it's, I was like, why can he do that? And I'm like, yeah, Nolan Ryan. 800 wins later but uh 5,000 strikeouts that's funny that you you had that same memory of of watching him do that um, incredible. I, I feel horrible but uh I've been getting some ESPN stuff and I got zoom call central they just threw me a game on Saturday so now I'm drinking out of a fire hose so oh well D- um, Denny are you cool to hang for a little longer yeah, yeah. absolutely sure. I, I guarantee you this Denny that Brandon will Brandon will ask you a question you've never been asked before. Oh, man. Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Perfect. No, he, yeah, he, he got me like four or five of them on our first opening, you know, intro on who we are and this and that. And I was just looking at him going, never been asked that question. Good. All right. So he, he, he found a way to get people. So beware. Appreciate you coming on. Let's stay in touch, brother. All right. Absolutely. Great to see you, Oli, man. And continued success on all the ESPN and everything else you're doing. Appreciate it, Denny. Talk to you soon, brother. See you. See you, man. So w- one thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, you got to be there for the transition from that 99 team with all the rookies, uh, 93. Like, so I started watching in 93, which is the worst possible time to become a fan, just because that's, yeah. that was the light period. And I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with you. Yeah. It's just, you know, that that's the way it was, but you got to see that through and play on the other side. Did it mean a lot to you to see that through? What was your mentorship like on that 99, 2000 team where they were they had like 20 rookies that year? I guess I'm just saying, could you walk us through that? Which is a lazy question. I understand, but there's a lot no, of meat no. on that bone. Um, when I look at when I debuted in 93 and then going all the way down to O2 when we finally got back in the playoffs, um, the work that went into that, the development, the, the drafting of players, the right guys, the, 
the trades and free agents and all those things. Like I look back at that, but one of the things I can really remember is when once Kirby left and then there was like really, I don't want to say no identity, but there was no identity, you yeah. know, at that point. And the cupboard was bare and we were just, we weren't contending. <clears throat> Let's put it that way. And it was frustrating because, um, you'd see the Vikings sell out. You'd see the T-Wolves sell out. And you knew it was a great fan base. And everybody would go, ah, it's summer. It's beautiful. They're on the lakes. And, and when we finally started to get respectable, and then we got better, and then we got good, and then we started competing, it was incredible the home field advantage that the fans created. And I think as a young player, you were like, the fan base just isn't very good here. They're not loyal, but you quickly realize if you put a quality product on the field, they come out in droves. And I can remember somebody used to have a countdown to the playoffs up in right field. And it was so cool being a part of something like that wow. and the, the home field advantage that we had. So it was, it was incredible to, to go from, the cupboard being bare, just coming off, you know, you had the World Series in 91 and then still being at that level and then gradually just going down and down through talent, through other teams getting better and then realizing you're on an upswing and then getting to that 0-2. It was an incredible transition. And I, I know that, um, you know, going from TK to Guardi, there were other candidates. But at the end of the day, we looked back and we said there was only one candidate to um, supplement Tom Kelly. And that was Barty because he knew the players, he knew the system, everybody knew him. And, and it was just the perfect transition. And, and again, in my opinion, you know, the twins did another great job of not missing that mark. And I wanted to ask you about the continuity in the organization. You get 11 parts of 11 years, uh, two managers over the span, I think, 30-ish seasons between TK and Gardy. You play for Joel Apple in the minors, and he was in the yeah. – I don't even know if he's still in the organization, but he was for a very long time. The continuity of the Twins organization. Now, granted, I know you probably can't speak to other organizations because you were with the Twins for so long, but I feel like that loyalty was a hallmark. I mean, Terry Ryan was around forever. Yeah. And uh, what, what was that like to have or see that level of continuity in this organization? It, it unheard of especially yeah. in that industry. Um, I just turned 52 last uh, in the beginning of April. And lo and behold, Terry Ryan sent me a text. And it blew my mind. And I he haven't did, talked to Terry. He did that for me too. I couldn't believe it. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, so how... You hear, oh, this is a great organization, and this and that. I mean, being being drafted by the Twins, coming up through their system, um, cutting my teeth, and then being able to go to playoffs. What an incredible journey. And to be able to do it with the same organization, with the same people. Joel Leppel never changed from the day that I met him to the day that I left that organization. You know, Tom Kelly never changed from the day that I met him to after I got done playing to when I wound up going into broadcasting and then getting back into baseball and then with the Orioles and going down to a spring training game and, and seeing Tom Kelly. Like the, the people are real. They're wholesome. They're genuine. They, they really care about um, <clears throat> the name on the front while still having any unique ability to care about the name on the back. And, and I, don't, I don't know how they do it. And it's not just one person. And I don't think it comes from just, oh, everything goes to the top. It's, it's, it's gotta be something in the fertilizer because everybody <laughs> is so good at it. I'm not gonna ask you to get into TK's head because that's probably a dangerous proposition. <laughs> but what, um, what do you think he was feeling? You know, the 2001 team was good, but just missed out. I think you guys are eliminated in the last week. But what do you think it was hard for him to hand it over? Because I feel like probably not as much as we think. I feel like once he was done, he was done, whether it was burnout or just TK being TK. But to hand it over to a manager who maintains that level of play certainly had to feel good. But 
did he do you think he want, would have liked to have been a part of that too i think he would have rather have been a part of it in the back seat than in the driver's seat mm-hmm. and i he believed that Gardy was capable of driving that bus tk had mentored him in ways that we'll never know and, and Gardy was a was an incredible baseball mind be, before he ever got that job and then when he got that job it was the right job and the people that were already in place um the, the relationships that he built how he could connect or challenge or discipline um guys what was incredible because he already had those relationships and when i look at tk uh, i think it was his time to I, I guess the way the, the team, the organization was Tom Kelly's child. Mm-hmm. And it was when he decided to back away, he knew that it was time that the team was graduating and, and leaving the roost. And, and I think he was, he wanted to see that from more of a 30,000 foot view because he was around, yeah. you know, and he, he would, he would come around every once in a while and, but you knew he was always there. Like you could feel his presence in the building. And he, he'd come up to you after a road trip and say, Hey, you know, I'll give you a, a wink and a nice job in Tampa or something like that. So mm-hmm. it was like a drive by. Yep. And you were just like, again, you're like, wait, what, wait, hang on. Hey, did, did somebody else hear that? Do I get a witness for TK giving me a compliment? Where are you? You know, we, We've seen so many times that teams have gone from one manager to another, though, and the transition period was rocky or just not easy. Uh, as far as how seamless something like that could be, would you say that it was fairly seamless? Without a doubt. Without a doubt. It was almost like, um, all right, everybody, nobody, everybody knew TK was leaving and the next guy in charge was, was going to be this guy. And he was just a manager and waiting. That was never said. But when you look at how it happened, you're like, oh, okay, I, I can see how that, this was going on in the background, I truly believe. Um, but like I said, we wouldn't have had the success in Guardi's first year mm-hmm. if there was another skipper writing lineups. I truly believe that. Did, did you have any good Guardi stories? Uh, my, my favorite one from covering the team was, he kept me behind one time and he said, hey kid, hang on, hang on. And then he showed me Kent Murphy videos <laughs> for baseball instructions on his, his, uh, his desktop computer there in target field. But I, I assume your story would be a little different since it was earlier in his tenure. Um, with, with Gardy. Yeah. There's some big league stuff, but what I remember, I remember how instrumental he was when he was coaching in the minor leagues and having the success. Yeah. And then um, I was, <laughs> I, I was obviously in the minor leagues and we would go to instructional league and the instruction that I would get, to become a better infielder from he and Al Newman and so many of the other coaches uh, was just incredible. The time that, that he would spend the extra work, the early work, and, and it was not just Gardy, but it was all those guys, Al Newman, you know, uh, Rick Anderson, Steve Little, um, Scotty Alger, all of these guys, that, names that I've, I'm throwing out that people in Minnesota should be very familiar with. Yep. Um, the, the dedication that they had for their craft to make players better, knowing that if we internally make players better, we don't have to go outside. We don't have to bring other guys in where yeah. it was truly special. So I look at, and there were times when, okay, it's curfew in, in instructional league and you get a knock on your door and they're like, Hey, come on, let's go. And, and they take you in a car and you'd go to a dumpster and, there'd be raccoons and oh. you know you're like trying to rattle raccoons and stuff so we, we had our fair share of, of really fun uh times later in the evenings and such um but the work that went into it was those are things that i remember about Cardi. so we we all know about kirby and herbeck and tory hunter and maybe even to some extent like eddie gordado was there a, a teammate who people might not realize was on a level higher than we'd expect. I mean, again, I know Tori was a big leader, but was there a teammate that stands out that maybe we don't know about? I mean, the leadership that Doug Mankiewicz Mm -hmm. had the intensity of AJ Pruszynski. And I know AJ, you know, kind of gets a bad rap, but that guy is a flat out winner. Nobody I'd rather have behind the dish. 
And and that's not the I, somebody can hear that and go, well, dude, Joe Maurer was such a better player. I, I get that. And I agree with that. But at the same time, I never played with Joe. You missed him. You just um, barely missed him. So, you know, I had to, he came, I think he came the day I was sick and I left my Jersey in my locker, I think. Oh um, yeah. yeah think that makes that sense. It, makes sense. You know? Who's this kid coming and taking my Jersey? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love, it's so funny, Brandon. Like I constantly joke about, oh yeah, my number's retired mm-hmm. and people freak out about that. They're like, how does a guy who only hit 250 in his big league career get his retired, get his number retired? You've got to be kidding me. What kind of standards are we having? And I'm like, you guys, okay, so when I'm sarcastic through print, I'll make sure I put an asterisk there. Yes. Um, but but some of the teammates, you know, Jason Maxwell was a guy that, and obviously my time with him right now through USA Baseball mm-hmm. was just a guy that came over and there's a long lineage of utility players so when i got there it was chip hale and jeff rebelay mm-hmm. we had like, reb on too already both incredible guys and yep. you know you're talking about a young player coming up to try to take your job and all they were going to do was just educate you on how to do the job because they knew that they were going to pass the baton right and it was incredible for me to see that to experience that <laughs> And then when both of those guys left and I had that opportunity to do that, you know, and Jason Maxwell came being able to pass that on to him. And it's almost like I look back and realize that they were giving me a gift and it was your opportunity to pass it on. And I passed it on to Jason and Jason passed it on to somebody else and Punto got a hold of it. And then, but these are all things that all these players continue to, to do, which is, which is really cool. So I look at players like that. Yeah. So another guy who had his number retired and hit 250 for his career was Harmon Killebrew. So you could put yourself on, on that Ooh. pedestal. And then two, um, you both finished with Kansas city and, and how difficult was it for you to not be with the twins anymore? I mean, you know, it was your last couple of years. You had Colorado, you had Kansas city. Yeah. Um, was it a big adjustment or not so much? It was devastating to leave the twins organization. Yeah. And I mean, even to this day, I've never, I've never done anything with them, whether it's um, a, a fantasy camp uh, or gone to spring training as an instructor or come back for Twins Fest. Like I've never been a part of that, uh, which which makes me sad mm-hmm. because I felt like that was my family. And I, I still really think that. Um, so it'll be it'll be pretty pretty I'll, I'll be emotional when i actually go to usa baseball this summer and we're at we're at um the the old screen the current spring training place yeah um down there it, it, i know i'll probably have to take a minute and, and and walk away for a second there and because so many things will come back but right you know i i'm out here in southern california uh actually i i help on a travel ball team one of my kids plays with my son at servite and lo and behold connecting the dots here really good friends with uh, Rod Carew. And I saw Rod the other night at the game and what an incredible person. And I was yeah. joking with him and uh, I said, Hey man, you know, maybe one of these days, the twins will invite me back for spring training or fantasy camp. And if they do, I'll buy you dinner. And Rod looked me square in the face and he goes, I'll take care of that. And I was like, Rod Carew, you are the man. So when you yeah. talk somebody like Harmon Killebrew, I, I think about Rod also. And, and, yep. you know, being on caravan with, with Harmon Killebrew, being able to be in a car with him and just listen to him and, and just see him oozing with just superiority um, with the smallest amount of ego. And, mm-hmm. and the best thing that Harmon Killebrew ever told me was, you know, when we do these autograph signings, I sit down people come to you before they come to me. And every time I get a baseball and look at your signature, I can't read one letter of yours. And I went, yes, sir. I got yep. you. Yeah. And the entire time on caravan, I was basically printing my autograph just out of respect for, for who Harmon was. And, and just for him to take a second to say that I knew it was important. Yep. And you, you know, Brandon, you've seen his autograph. It is as legible as, the Bible. <laughs> yeah, and Trevor Ploof told me that. So same story. So it's, it definitely went on from that era on. Do you, do you got time for two more? 
Yeah, I got you. Okay. Uh, the adjustment in weather from California to Minnesota. Uh, tell me about that because obviously you played indoors and you had time all over the place, but you're still Cali at heart, I'm sure. What, uh, what was that adjustment like for you? I would say the biggest adjustment was leaving for spring training. You're yeah. in 80 degree weather and now you're going to Florida and it's humid. So it's just straight beach wear. You know, you're not packing a pair of pants and then you're like, oh, wait, we opened up in Detroit. So now I've got to have a snorkel jacket, a scuba <laughs> suit and, and a fur coat. And so the, the amount of packing you had to do <laughs> to go to spring training was incredible. But um, I absolutely loved the Metrodome because you knew that you could pull up right when the schedule was, was, was printed. You're like, okay, I know we've got 81 home dates. It's not like, well, we're going to get snowed out in this day and, and, and that. You always knew you weren't going to play double headers, which was always, I, I think, I felt like that was an advantage. Um, so being the controlled, con the controlled environment was great. My biggest thing was, all right, you're not about to, we, in April, my wife and I, and the kids, we, we ate a lot of meals in the house, put it that mm -hmm. way. Cause it yeah. wasn't like we were going and, and trying to transition the kids because the kids were super young. I mean, they were born in, uh, in 99. So they were there for, you know, the, the three, pl three plus years when I was in Minnesota, but we, we were not about to put them in the car and then go and take them out in their carriages and then do a, we're like, no, we're, we're eating at home. And it was like from the garage in the town home to underneath in the Metrodome. Like that was, that was where we went. So the wet, the weather never really bothered us. Um, and then the off days were always spent at like at Mall of America, just that indoors. But I can imagine what, what they've gone through, but yep. at the same time, some of the weather restrictions now being at target field, uh, the beauty of that place, uh, I think is well worth it. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember my first memory of you as a player, I think it was 93 and you grounded Struck out. out. The base is loaded. Uh, no, you grounded out <laughs> or you bunted. And I remember thinking this is the fastest baseball player I've ever seen. And I think it spoke more to <laughs> your level of hustle than anything, but I, I just thought maybe you'd enjoy hearing that because I remember thinking, yeah, this, this guy is the fastest person I have ever seen. Well, it, it's funny, Brandon, you say that because I think you are, if you pay attention, you're a product of your environment. Yeah. My first spring training, Kirby <laughs> Puckett's first at bat, he hit a chopper to the pitcher. And he, he, we know Kirby, he sprinted to first base. And Tom Kelly walked up and down that dugout going, that's the highest paid son of a gun in this league. And you see how he hustles. He ran out of the box like that was a triple. And I expect that. And I was like duly noted. And, and I, don't, I don't know if I ever took it 30% down the line, but I felt like I was way more towards 100 every single time yeah. um, because Kirby had set that and somebody had set that that standard before Kirby and somebody had done that before, before him as well. And then finally, did you have a favorite defensive position? Cause you played everywhere. Shortstop. I love shortstop. Yeah. Shortstop was my opportunity to um, be, be the quarterback in the huddle. You can be so vocal. You can move guys, you see pitches, you can anticipate. So those are things that that was the position that I would, I would play. Uh, okay. which, which can I, can you do anything? I want to go play short. Yeah. Well, Hey, thank you so much for the time. Uh, thank you from on Greg's behalf to Greg had to, as, as people might know, dip for uh, other reasons for today, but that's okay. Uh, again, thank you for the time. People can follow you on Twitter at big league swings and hopefully we can catch with catch up with you down the road. Absolutely, man. Brandon. Thanks. Sorry about last week. I had a little confusion, but All good. Uh, yeah, I'm a smarter person a week later. So, uh, Glad to be a part of your podcast and glad to be a part of your show, man. You're doing a great job. Well, we, we know hindsight is 2020 again. Thank you for your time. This has been that nineties baseball pod powered by access twins and we'll catch you later. Peace.